chapter 4 and verse 1. Ezra chapter 4 and verse 1. The scripture says, Now when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard the children of the captivity builded the temple unto the Lord God of Israel, then they came to Zerubbabel. Father, bless your word now in thy holy name. Amen. You can be seated. To understand a little bit about what we're talking about, the books of Ezra and Nehemiah go together. They're connected, connected very strongly. And uh, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Zerubbabel play a very important part in the restoration of Israel to the land. God used his prophets beforehand to prophesy to them, to warn them. He told them what was going to happen. They made fun of them. They mocked them. They threw them into the pits. They, 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 uh, in the case of Micaiah, uh, they almost killed him. And, And the king says he has nothing good to say about me. And over and over and over and over again, we find God warning his people. And, uh, they continued, uh, to, uh, into apostasy and so God took them in 722 BC the Assyrians came into the north and they carried off many of the land but they left a lot of them there too and they mixed with them they intermingled with them they, they married into them and the Assyrians did in the north in the southern two tribes in 586 BC were carried off to Babylon that's where you find Daniel that's where you find Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah you find these, they came from the southern tribes, and they were carried to, to, uh, to Babylon. And there's a great story to be told about all of that. But when they came back from the land, they're coming back in stages. They don't just come back at one time. They come back in stages. And uh, we read about how Zerubbabel came back to the walls, and he got on a horse, and he rode around the walls of Jerusalem to see what kind of shape they were in, to see what needed to be done to build, to not Zerubbabel, but Nehemiah, to see what needed to be done. And then Zerubbabel is the one who built the temple. And, uh, and, and, by, and, and in building the temple, of course, they restore the sacrifice and the priesthood. And that's what Ezra did. Ezra was responsible for, sacri- for stab- reestablishing the priesthood. If you read the book of Ezra, you'll find a long genealogy that gives you the, the credentials of Ezra, who he was. He could trace his bloodline all the way back to Aaron, and it shows up there. So what we're going to read tonight is about the opposition, and there's always opposition, and God allows opposition. Opposition makes you stronger. Opposition gives you discernment. Opposition forces you to go to the one who can answer your prayers. Opposition is what makes you understand the, the nature of the battle, and we're in a battle. We're good soldiers of the cross. He said, and, and so that's what we're doing tonight. And, and I mean, it's changing before your very eyes. We have people out here in this country right now that make no bones about it. They hate America, and they want to tear it down. They want to tear it down. And so I've never seen that before, but that's what we have. So we have to understand the nature of the battle. We have to understand who the enemy is. We have to understand the logistics of it. How are we going to deal with this? And of course you say, well, the devil is the, is the enemy. Yes, he is, but he uses people. He uses people. And so you have to be careful with that and who claims to be your friend and is not. That's what you have in the book of Ezra. When the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard the children of the captivity builded the temple unto the Lord God of Israel, then they came to Zerubbabel. And the chief of the fathers said to them, Let us build with you, for we seek your God as ye do. And we do sacrifice unto him since the days of Esarhaddon, king of Assur, Asher, which brought us up hither. See what's going on here? They're trying to, they're trying to worm their way in, into the midst of God's people. And of course, they didn't let him do it. They said, you have no part in this, and you'll not be part of what goes on here. And they refused to let them. Of course, when this happened, they made enemies. And these enemies wrote letters back to the king and said that these people are coming to overthrow the kingdom. And they said that this Jerusalem has always been a rebellious city. And so they write letters back and they try their best and eventually it stopped. The building of the the temple is stopped and it has to be started again. But this is your enemy. Now look at chapter number 4 of the book of Nehemiah and verse number 1. Nehemiah chapter 4 and verse 1. I'm moving through these because there's a lot of ground to cover. Now, each one of these men, Zerubbabel, Nehemiah, and Ezra, each one of them had a specific job to do. 
They had a specific calling from God. It was not Ezra's place to build the temple. It wasn't Nehemiah's place to, uh, to restore the priesthood. And each one abided in the calling wherewith they were called. That's so important tonight. The scripture said in Nehemiah chapter number 4 and verse 1. It came to pass that when Sanballat heard that we builded the wall, he was wroth and took great indignation and mocked the Jews. See the enemy? He mocks. First he tries to join up with you. If he can't join up with you, he'll mock you. And it goes even deeper than that. Look at chapter number 10 of Ezra in, the book, in verse number 44. Ezra chapter number 10 in verse number 44. I'm not going to read all that goes on here. But here's what happens. The people of the land had, the Jews had married into the Canaanites. They had married into these people and many of them were under a curse. And what was even worse, many of them that were priests in the priestly line had married into the people of the land. It was a sad thing because they had children. And it's like the DACA here in America. It's like DACA. Deferred something, something, something. Kids that were born of illegal aliens in this country or, or were brought into this country as children. And this is the only country they've ever known, you see. That's rough. That's tough business to try to just kick them out, right? And so, you know, things get complicated. And if you have a heart and you have a soul, then you have to figure out, well, how are we going to deal with this? What do we need, what do, we need to do? And, uh, and, of course, this is the idea. What we have here are children that are born with no fault of their own and no choice of their own, but they're born of, of, a, of an unlawful union. And Ezra, of course, is going to have to be the fall guy. He's going to be the one that everybody hates because he got on his face and he cried out to God. And he said, Lord, he said, I know the priesthood must be pure. It has to be restored. The genealogy has to be right. So why is it so important? Well, what does Genesis 3.15 say? Genesis 3.15. He, prophet, he prophesied the Messiah, the Mashiach. All right. And what did he say about the line of David? He said there will never fail to there will never cease to be one to sit on the throne of David. When the Lord Jesus sits down on that throne in Jerusalem, and I hope it would be about two thousand six, seven, eight, nine, somewhere along in there. And when he sits down on that throne in Jerusalem, he'll reign for a thousand years, amen. And that is the throne of David restored. And so it's gonna happen. It's gonna happen, but you can't have an admixture because you're going to have a you're going to have a perversion an adulteration you're going to have an you're going to have an uh, you're going to have an alien element brought into it you say well now i mean this is gets into a racial thing well you got to understand something god chose the jew to be the one who gave his word to the world and he chose the jew to bring the messiah into this world and he chose the Jew to be the keepers of the oracles of God. And the Bible says in the book of the New Testament to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So, you know, I didn't do this. And I'm not saying the Jews any better than anybody else. But God chose them. And I thought I'll tell you why he chose them. He chose them because he could have one people. One people. And, and they, wouldn't, they would not be a mixture of Hittites and Ammonites and all the rest of them. One people, and these people were the ones who were the givers, gave, gave them the law, gave them the Messiah, and gave them Jerusalem. And as you know today, July the 1st, that they were going to annex what they call the West Bank. Now, when you hear West Bank, that's garbage. We're talking about Judea and Samaria. Long before there was any West Bank, this land was given to Abraham in Genesis 15. You have to understand that. That goes way back before any of the modern, uh, you know, so forth. So today they were supposed to begin the annexation of the West Bank into Israel. Now, of course, they're, by the thousands, they're marching out there. Now, are we against uh, Palestinians? Why, no, 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 not at all. But you have to understand, they'll never be blessed by, take, by trying to take the land away from the rightful owner of it. That's the problem. They'll never be blessed. God gave Israel that land, and it will be their land in perpetuity. Even in the millennium, it's their land, and in eternity, it's their land. 
God promised to bless them and bring them into the land. But in any event, this is what's happening right now in, over there in Jerusalem. Now keep your eye on it. It's important because uh, we could have some fighting. We could, we, could have, we could get into a shooting war over this. And it could, be, it could be like what happened in World War I when people who had already signed alliances with each other and then once we had the confrontation of only two nations, the rest of them had to join in and support the ones that they had signed up with. And first thing you know, we've got a world war going on. And that's how World War I started. And uh, this war can start like that too. Now, of course, if we have a war that starts, what does that say to us? We want peace, right? Yeah. Well, watch it. Yeah. Because the peacemaker, when it comes to Israel, sure does begin to fit into that category of the Antichrist. So here's verse number 44 of Ezra chapter number 10. It says, And these had taken strange wives, and some of them had wives by whom they had children. You know, I don't know if you understand this tonight or not. I think you do. The innocent suffer more than anybody else. These children are innocent, but they can't be part. And they suffer. They're going to suffer. I wonder how they felt when they saw their daddy leave. Daddy had to leave. Daddy couldn't come back. And mama had to raise them. I mean, the, it was a clean break. We say, why? Because they're under the law. You see, the law is, uh, it was never given to save people. It was given to guide them and convict them. And show them their need of a Savior. And this is where we go. In the book of Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1. The apostle tells the Judaizers. Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. Be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. He has some, he has some rough things to say about the law. He called it a yoke of bondage. Here in Galatians 5. Galatians chapter number 3 and verse 1. He said, O foolish Galatians. Who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you? Now watch the reasoning. This only what I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? <coughs> There's an answer here. There's got to be an answer. All right. Which, which way did you receive the Spirit of God? Notice. In the Old Testament, the Spirit of God could come on them and then leave them. David said in the book of Psalms, Lord, take not thine Holy Spirit from me. You know, be very careful. There's a lot of people who mean well. You hear a lot of that today. And they'll run to an Old Testament passage like that. And they'll try to drag it over here into the New Testament and say to you, Well, look, see how you can lose the Holy Spirit? The thing is... Not a one of them in the Old Testament were born of the Spirit of God. The fatherhood of God in the Old Testament is a corporate thing. So what do you mean by that? A national, national thing. Sons of God because that God is the father of Israel. All right. They are, you are my sons and my daughters in that sense. But when we come to the New Testament, it's no longer a corporate thing where you're the son of God. You're the son of God literally by being born of God. There's a difference there. Being born of God, you're born of the Holy Spirit. And you're sealed by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, He cannot take that Holy Spirit from you. You are His and He is yours for eternity. Nothing is going to change that. In Galatians 3 and verse 10, He said, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the, what? Curse. Now, He just told you that the law was a yoke of bondage. And now he's telling you that it's curse. Well, did God give them the law to curse them? No, he gave them the law to teach them. And he, he said, this is our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. When you grew up, you were learning things. You had no idea. You learned the alphabet first, right? You learned the alphabet. When you were learning it, you thought to yourself, what's this thing? And then the teacher told you, she put letters together to form words. And then you said, well, what's this? And then she gives you a little book, and these words are put together to form a sentence. 
and the sentence says something, there's an idea, a thought or something in there, then you're reading because you started with the basics, the alphabet. Well, this is what God did. He took them to the basics. He showed them their lost condition. He showed them how wicked and vile humanity is. But he also showed them how that the law was completely incapable of saving you. Its purpose was a schoolmaster. It was given to teach you, to bring you up to the point to where you're ready to accept the grace of God. Any man who wants to drag you under the law today is a hypocrite and self-righteous. Any man that points to anything except the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ is a heretic. You don't want to be mean, but I'm going to be plain with you. The Lord Jesus Christ plus or minus nothing. The Lord Jesus is everything. He is our salvation. Don't need anything to add to that. You can add works, good works, all that, and as a disciple, discipleship and all of that, but have nothing to do with your salvation. You see, well, anyway, the Apostle Paul told him, he said, As many as run to the curse, it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things uh, which are written in the book of the law to do them. Well, who could? <laughs> and you realize now that they've counted in the, in the Talmud, the Talmud, you all know what the Talmud is, 613 laws on top of the Ten Commandments. That's a pile of laws. I wouldn't think anybody would know all of them. <laughs> Here's the bottom line. It's wrong to do this. Don't go there. Don't say this. What are you doing? You're going to get cursed. You can't live like that. But there are people who honestly believe that that is their salvation. It's not. You're, a person is your salvation. And he said the law is not of faith and so forth. Galatians 3 verse 14. The blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now listen. When did Moses live? About when? About 1,000 B.C., right? I mean 1,400 B.C., right? Okay, 1,400. Uh, 1,400 B.C., we've got David, 1,000 B.C. All right, now who lived before Moses? That we're talking about when? Yeah, Moses. I mean, what was his name? And when did he live? 1900. Okay. What's the difference between 14 and 19? 500 years. 500 years. You will not find in that Bible anything that ever said Abraham was cursed. He was blessed. Well, this is the point that the apostle is making in Galatians. Abraham is blessed before the law was ever given. And that the blessings, not the curse of the law, but the blessings of Abraham might come on those that believe. Well, that's what I want. And the Bible says that the law is the, is, is the father of all the faithful. Right? No. Abraham is the father of all the faithful. Not the law. Paul is making a point here with these folks, and he's trying to say to them, listen carefully. You Judaizers and you people who think that the law in some way or another is going to bolster your faith in Christ, you need to understand something. He said the law is bondage, the law is a curse, and that the only way to be right with God is to be right with God the way Abraham was. He believed God, and God counted it to him for righteousness. Amen. He believed him. And when did he do that? 500 years before the law was given. So if I'd been alive 2,000 years ago and been a Jew, pork abstaining, Sabbath keeping, temple, uh, you know, a visiting Jew, and he said something like that to me, I'd have to say, well, Abraham is our father, right? Is Abraham their father? Yes. They claimed Abraham to be their father. And so the Apostle Paul made a very simple, clear message to them. If Abraham is your father, you are not begotten by the law. You are begotten by the faith that Abraham had in God. And they are. They are. The same God that saved Abraham saves us. And the same thing that saved Abraham saves us. Faith. He believed in the Lord. The Lord counted in him for righteousness. Amen. I mean, you can't get around an argument like that. The apostle is a very logical thinker. Chapter number 3 and verse 24, he says, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. How many of you remember first grade? 
<laughs> How many can't get past 10th grade? You don't remember anything before that, huh? How many went to kindergarten? Back when I went to school, there wasn't much kindergarten. I was five years old when I started in the first grade. Then I turned six not too long afterward. And we had first grade. I really enjoyed it. I really did. I loved the reading part. I really did. I enjoyed school. I enjoyed learning. I've always enjoyed learning. Even now, I enjoy learning. I get excited when I begin to learn something. So how do you know you're learning? Because your mind is beginning to work. And you're beginning to take hold of concepts, things that you didn't know. And the more you learn, the more, the more it establishes your foundation. And the deeper you get into things. The schoolmaster. And I can say this tonight. My teachers were good teachers. They were good. And teachers back then, there was a lot of difference in, in a lot of the teachers. Well, not all of them, but a lot of the teachers we have today don't have anywhere near the character that those teachers had. We respected them. No, well, you would never, you would never have seen uh, people scream at one of those teachers uh, like they do today. Did not happen. And uh, but that's just this is what happens with the culture. He said he was a schoolmaster to be bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. And then in verse twenty nine, he said, "If you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise." All right, Abraham's seed. Was Abraham the father of the Lord Jesus Christ? Look here, Matthew chapter, when I say father, I'm talking, I'm not saying, you know, who was the father of Christ? God was, but I'm talking about an earthly. Look at Matthew chapter 1. You understand the context of what I'm saying. Matthew 1. Verse 1. All right, now what's it say? Verse number 1. Son of Abraham, right? Okay, you see that? Was Abraham the physical father of Christ? Of course not. The Lord Jesus Christ, God was his father. That way he was born perfect, sinless. He did not have original sin passed down to him. Go back and read Romans 5 and you'll, you'll read about how that by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. Romans 5. But that's not with Christ because he was not born of a man. But God put him here in Matthew chapter number 1 for a reason. What is this the genealogy of in Matthew 1? Is this the genealogy of Abraham or is it the genealogy of David? Who comes first? David. Why? Because this is a monarchy. This is the, this is the lineage of a king, David. The Lord Jesus Christ, therefore, is in the lineage of the king. How did he get there? He got there by faith. Look over here in the book of Galatians. Go back and look at Galatians with me. And chapter number 3, verse 29. And if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed. And heirs according to the promise. I want you to read Galatians when you get home. And read the word seed. And you'll find out that it says. Christ was his seed. Not seeds. But seed. Therefore by the faith Abraham had in God the Father. The Almighty. Saving faith. That faith produced seed. That seed of the faithful one. Was, is where you come in. To the family of God. That seed. Faith, not seeds, but one seed, Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, was the seed of Abraham by faith, not by physical generation. Now, I want you to turn to the book of Ezra, chapter number 8 tonight, and verse 22. This is a very unusual statement. When I was reading this today, I read that, and I... I read it again, and I thought, no, wait a minute. And it got a hold of me. See if it does you when we read it. Ezra 8, verse 22. Ezra is going back into the Holy Land. In those days, you had robbers. They called them the Sakari. They were the, the dagger men. 
You had thieves and robbers and, you know, everything. And so therefore they traveled in companies for safety. And so Ezra is going to go back to the land and King offers him company. He offers him protection. He offers him somebody to, you know, watch over him. And Ezra had been preaching. He had been preaching about how God was, uh, here's what he said. The hand of our God is upon all them for good that seek him. And his power and his wrath is against all them that forsake him. How many agree with that? Right, now you're about to read a practical application of a profound truth. Watch this. This is remarkable. Let's read verse 22 and 23. I was ashamed to require of the king a band of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy in the way. Because we had spoken unto the king, saying, here we go, The hand of our God is upon all them for good that seek him. But his power and his wrath is against all them that forsake him. That's good. It's, that's good stuff, right? That doesn't mean a thing until it becomes real to you. Here's how it happened. Look at it. Verse 23. So I fasted and besought our God for this. And he was entreated of us. Look up that word entreat when you get home. You know what that means? He interceded for us. We didn't take for granted God's promise. We called upon the Lord when we got right with him. They fasted and they prayed. The Bible's full of the promises of God, right? Full of them. But don't take them for granted. You see, don't be presumptuous with God. God doesn't like that. <laughs> Presumptuousness. I've shown you time and time and time again where they get in trouble. Uh, Kadesh Barnea, for example, is a prime example. God said something that's a promise that you take hold of. You embrace it. That's good. That's good. Uh, I've had people tell me, and I've said it myself down through the years, the Lord gave me a scripture preacher, the Lord gave me a scripture, and I'm going to hold on to that. Good for you. God bless you. That's the thing to do. But what did he do? You know what he did? He called upon the Lord until the Lord entreated for him. In other words, interceded. Who did he intercede with? How did God step into this? How did God become part of the equation? He entreated for him, when he literally took the promise that God gave him and made it a reality. If God promises something in his word, is he able to back it up? That's the point, see. That's the point. That's the point. But in order to back it up, we have Ezra fasting and he's praying, besought God. Do you remember what Daniel did in the book of Daniel? Daniel chapter 9. You ought to read it when you get a chance. Read Daniel 9. He said, I was fasting and I was praying for my people. He said, I pour my heart out to God. He said, we've sinned. He's confessing sin for them. <laughs> we've sinned, Daniel said. He understood something. Daniel was a very spiritual man. He understood why they were in Babylon. And then he said, God gave him a vision. And you know what vision he gave him? Nine chapter of Daniel? I mean, he think tonight. Well, it's called the 70 weeks of Daniel. That's what he gave him. And that's one of the most profound scriptures in all the Bible. And he told him a date to start one. Know that from the commandment to go forth to restore and rebuild until Messiah the Prince is such and such amount of time. And do you know what? You can go chase it, trace it back and you'll find out that from that commandment until Christ came into this world, it was exactly on point. That's why they don't like Daniel. But what was Daniel doing to get that from God? Fasting and praying. Seeking the face of the Lord. Some folks can't fast. I understand that. I have to wear a mask in places. When I go to the hospital, I have to wear a mask. I can't breathe. I have no reserve. You know, I can't go long with a mask on. Linda said I look better with one on. You know, I appreciate that, I said. man said to me one time, he said, if I had another face, I'd wear it. <laughs> so that's what happens to you. A lot of road wear. <laughs> But the truth of the matter is, everybody can't do the same thing. And God knows what you can do. And when you want to get real serious with him about something and take hold of his word, do that. 
He loves for people to do that. He does. Call unto me, he said, I'll answer thee. And he will. Just take hold of his word, embrace it. And if, if you can fast, if God wants you to put you in a fast, you do that. If it's prayer, if it's something else, whatever it is, you do it. We, act, we all can't do the same thing, though. And so you just do it within the limitations of your own life. I thought that was quite a thing. Ezra took God's promise, but he knew what it took to get a hold of that promise. And God blessed him for it. Father, bless your word. Thank you for the time we have spent together, Lord, tonight in your word. The Ezra was a great man, Lord. So was Zerubbabel. So was Nehemiah. These are wonderful men, Father. They did exactly what you called them to do. They served you in their generation in doing what you told them to do. And Heavenly Father, they were successful at it because they were serving you and they did what you told them. Lord, may we live, learn from their lives, our Father. May we go to Hebrews chapter 11 and read that great pantheon, hall of faith of those who loved you and served you. Learn great truths from that. They're just, we can learn so much from them, Father, because they're men just like us. and Women just like us. We thank you for that. Now bless our brothers and bless our sisters. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you for coming, listening to me. We'll meet Sunday morning, 10 o'clock.